Good morning. I want to just share some things from my devotional. And I think it's nice to share on video. because. So if you want to just give me like probably 20, even 30 minutes. Um, I've been having a struggle with the Lord about hell. And I honestly, I can't see that um, anyone doesn't struggle with the fact that God, God assign, sends people to hell. If we believe in heaven, then we have to believe in hell. Because how we know about heaven is from the Bible. And the same Bible talks about hell. And Jesus talked about it a lot. And the reason Jesus talked about it a lot is that he came to save people from it. So um, I've had a couple deaths in the family and, um, and an acquaintance uh, died this week and I don't know about their eternal security. I'm not gonna assign them to heaven or hell. I don't know where they were with the Lord or anything like that, but um, uh, I just wondered where they were gonna go after they died. And I just felt horrible uh, about their eternal security, not knowing that, to, to my knowledge, they've never confessed Jesus as Savior, so I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but I wasn't involved in their life in the last few years that often. So anyway, uh, I was reading Exodus 19, and um, God wants to redeem this people to be his people, this holy God. So he tells Moses, I want to talk to the people. I want them to experience some of what you've experienced about me. God never totally revealed himself to Moses even. You know, Moses said, I want to see you. And he said, okay, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the, of the rock, and I'm just going to show you my backside. That's it. And that was so much for Moses that when he came down off of the mountain, he had to put a veil on his face because the people couldn't even stand to look at the face of Moses who had seen the backside of God. Okay? So I think one of the uh, reasons that I struggle in uh, hell and different concepts of God is I think that I do, and I'm pretty sure a lot of us, we approach God as if he is like us. Um, people will say, well, my God, they have this concept in their head of who God is. They don't read the Bible. Um, and they say, well, my God wouldn't do this. Or people say, I wouldn't um, do this. So we, when we say, my God, this is the God that I like, this is the God that I want, or I wouldn't do that, we're reducing God to us. It's actually, we're our God. If you, if you put God into your imagination and, and, and hold him accountable to what you would do, he's actually not your God. You are your God you um, don't choose to submit to God. So um, I think that's one of our problems is even those that want to submit to God and see him as God, we just tend to see him as a person, um, as human. So uh, anyway, so God wants to be become the God of these people and redeem them. So he says, I'm going to show them some of myself and I'm going to come to Mount Sinai in a cloud. Um, he came and, and but what the people have to do is consecrate themselves for three days. They have to wash their clothes. They have to go through ceremonial washings. I'm sure they had blood sacrifices. Even the priests that were constantly consecrating themselves had to go through a series of rituals. Prepare yourself to see part of me on a mountain. That's how holy God is. Okay. So, um, on the morning, okay, so on the third day, uh, Moses went down from the mountain to the people consecrated and consecrated the people. They washed their garments, and he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Don't go near women. Don't have sexual relations for the three days. 
And on the morning of the three day, there were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, which is like a ram's horn. Trumpets weren't invented in those days. When they say a trumpet blast, it was like a ram's horn, just so you know for the trumpet players out there. Um, there was a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord descended it, descended on it in fire. The smoke went up like smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord and look, and many of them will perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said, go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. Do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. And Moses went down to the people and told them. And then Moses speaks, and then God speaks. So God has a character and nature that he is holy. And if sin comes near him, the holiness of God will consume that person. That does not change. God cannot change and now not be holy to dwell with people. He has to make people holy so that they can dwell with him. He's not going to change for us. Okay, that's the God of the Old Testament, who is the God of the New Testament. And when Moses said, Lord, show me yourself, he hid him in the cleft of the rock and he said, the Lord, the Lord is merciful and gracious. And he says, but he does not leave sin unpunished. So God is merciful. He wants us to know that. When Moses said, what is your character? Tell me who you are. The first thing that he said, is the Lord is merciful and gracious, abounding in love and steadfast love. However, he does not let sin go unpunished. God is holy. Sin will not come near him. He will break out against it and destroy sin. He, he, that, he is, that is his character. We're going to find out that God says, I am a consuming fire. God consumes sin with fire. That's who God is. He's not like us. He's not created. He is self-existent. Okay. Now let's go over to the New Testament and the, and the instructions for the people in Hebrews chapter 12. Okay. Now, in Hebrews, God is instructing the church, okay? And he's telling us, give us instructions on how to live for him, how to approach him, okay? And we must be instructed by the Lord. If he is our God, we must find out. The Bible says, find out what pleases the Lord, okay? And this Bible, we have to submit to God. We can't have God submit to us. He will consume us. We must learn how to approach a holy God, even today, that we don't see him consuming people, okay? And Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings closely, and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. God tells us to run the race towards heaven. He's given us, when we come to Jesus Christ, he gives the, us the power to run 
the race. Before Christ, we cannot be holy. We Sin is our master. The Bible says that, that sin, we are slaves to sin. But once he cleanses us by his blood, gives us the Holy Spirit, the grace of God, the word of God, the church of God, he gives us all the equipment. Now we can run that race towards heaven. And he says to throw off every sin that kings closely. Run with endurance. Get rid of these things out of your life. Okay? And then he goes on to say, um, consider him who endured from sinners hostility against himself so that you do not grow weary and faint-hearted. God calls Christians to run the race in holiness. And he says in Hebrews 12, 4, and in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord or be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure for God is treating you as sins. And then it goes, uh, sons, I'm sorry. So we are called when we come to Christ to run a race. In Ephesians, it says to fight the fight against sin. We have weapons to fight against sin in our life. Before Christ, we don't have any weapons to fight sin. We are dead in sin and trespasses, and we cannot not sin. Okay? When we come to Christ, he gives us, gives us the equipment to be holy and to submit to the same. We won't be holy instantly. There's a process, a sanctify, sanctification process where we run the race and we submit ourselves to our Father who disciplines us and gets rid of sin in our life. That is what we are called to be as Christians. We are called to be children who submit to the Father of our soul to discipline us so that we can be holy and acceptable before him so that we can dwell with him for eternity. That's why he redeemed us. That's why he doesn't take us home the minute we get saved. Because he is getting things out of us. He is making us a holy people. Okay? Now, uh, he goes on. And he talks about the new covenant. Okay? Now, God is so holy, and he wants to dwell. He wants out of every nation every tribe a people for himself so god hates hell so much god is so holy and his character when sin comes near him he must consume sin so he became sin for us when he emptied himself and became a man he became a lamb a sacrifice beaten and tortured and shedding his blood because he hates hell more than I do so that he can redeem a people so that we can come to him, that we can be washed clean by his blood, that the word of God can wash us, that he can give us a part of himself, the Holy Spirit that makes us holy, and he can give us the grace and the power, and he's given us his word, he's given us the church, he's given us the tools to become a people, to consecrate ourselves, to lay aside sin, to wash our clothes, to get ready for heaven. That's what we're doing here on earth. We're preparing ourselves to meet a holy God that he will not consume us. That's what we're here for. That's why we became Christians. Now let's go over to Timothy. And I think a lot of the reason that I have trouble with the whole concept of hell is because in Western civilization, and especially America, I have sat under false teachers. And I, I get in God's word every day, but God has to get that false teaching and thinking out of me. And, some t and, and so much of America is sitting under false, a false gospel and false teaching, teaching. They're perishing 
They're not prepared to go before a holy God. And when you talk about things like this, they come against you. You are judgmental, you're self-righteous, you're this, you're that. No, I know I'm a sinner. I know I am not worthy to come before a holy God. I know Jesus has cl is cleansing me. He has sanctified me. And when I die, I will be like him. Then the process is over. I understand that I am a sinner. Okay, that's why I'm talking about this. Okay, because I have to approach God how he wants me to. Because if I don't, I am such a sinner, he will consume me. And he will send me to the fire of hell. Because he is holy, and I don't want God to break out against me. Okay? Now, in 1 Timothy, he talks about this false teaching that we sit under in America. And I'm sure other places in the world. And it's uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verses 3, teach, to, at the end of chapter 2, 1 Timothy 6, 2, teach and urge these things, urge people. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, if somebody does not teach about godliness, and the teachings of Christ, he is puffed up, he is conceited, and he understands nothing. If a preacher does not understand godliness, a holy God, he is puffed up, he is conceited, and he understands nothing. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. He's a fool. If the preacher does not first preach sanctification and while we're saved, and that sinners need to repent, he is puffed up, conceited, and understands nothing. Because the basic concept of the Bible is that God is holy. And without holiness, no one will see the Lord. One preacher of a big church here in Charlotte with 30,000 people said that God broke the law to reach you. He doesn't even understand that God will not violate who he is. God doesn't break his laws. He's holy. He fulfilled the laws, the Old Testament blood sacrifices by becoming the law. He fulfilled it. Not one jot or tittle of the law was broken in Jesus Christ. He came to fulfill it. And that teacher doesn't understand the holiness of God. He doesn't understand anything. And he went to, and he went to um, seminary for four years. Don't sit under that. Because if you're not prepared to go before a holy God when you die, you will be consumed. He will not come near you. <clears throat> if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound lords of our Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up, conceited, and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, and evil suspicions. And constant friction among people who are a depraved mind and depraved of the truth. God warns us about false teachers, and he tells us not to take part of false teaching. Imagining the false teacher, this is 1 Timothy 6, chapter, uh, verse 5. Imagining the false teacher that godliness is a means of gain. The false teachers out there, if they even mention godliness, they're preaching that if you, if you come to God and you, and you, and you uh, accept Jesus Christ, then you will be successful. That godliness is a means of gain. Paul said, I brought nothing in this world. I consider everything dung except for Jesus Christ. Paul gave up everything. 
God does bless us. He will bless who he will bless. There are other Christians that live in poverty their whole life that are more godly than any of us would ever be. So these preachers preach that bless me, bless me, bless me. When hardship comes and the discipline of the Lord comes, when God is, God is making you holy and acceptable to him so that you can enter heaven, people that think that if I come to Jesus, I'll have financial gain, when there's trouble comes, they don't understand it. They're under a false teaching. They're under a false gospel. And I am not the judge of, every, of everything, and I hope to God, but I would fear that they would go to hell if you don't submit under the true word of God and you're sitting under a false teacher that teaches that godliness is a means of gain. Your soul is in jeopardy. I'm not going to judge whether it's going to go to heaven or hell or not. But your, your, your eternal salvation is not secure. He says that they teach that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with accepting your lot in life is great gain. For we brought, oh, here it is. For we brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Let me read this again. This is important in the United States of America. This is how the Bible says to recognize false teachers that teach a different gospel than the one that's preached. If you're believing a different gospel, you're not saved. Repent. Get out of that church. Flee the false teacher. The false teacher teaches that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. If we have food and clothing, with these that will be, we will be content. Godliness, holiness is more important than the riches of the world. But Valerie, you sit in a lake house. Look what God did for you. Yes, he did. I'm not going to deny the blessings of God on my life, but that is not the reason that I serve him. God does bless his people, but there are many, many people sitting in poverty that are very, very godly as well. I don't know why God chose this lot for me. And my blessings could leave tomorrow. I don't hold on to them. I'm not a hypocrite. I acknowledge that God has blessed me abundantly above all I could ask or imagine. And that is true. But there are people much more godly than I am in poverty. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare. You're in the snare of the devil if you're following God to get rich. Into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. Are you going to church for blessing? For the love of money? Or are you going to church because you realize that you're a sinner? And you're not acceptable to God. And you want to submit to him and be acceptable to him. Why, why are you in church? What is your preacher preaching? For the love of money is the root of evil. That's a doctrine of devils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, Christian, flee these things. 1 Timothy 6, 7. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Get out of the false teaching. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, 
gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made a good confession in the presence of many. <clears throat> so that is the holy God that was on Mount Sinai is now on Mount Zion offering himself as a sacrifice to make you holy. That is the purpose of your Christianity. I just want to um, close back to Hebrews 12. <clears throat> But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels and festival gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the covenant. There's only one way to approach God, and that is through the mediator, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There's no other way by which you can be saved. God is holy and he has ways of you to approach him. And do not think that you will approach him outside of Jesus Christ. All religions do not lead to God. Jesus Christ does. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that sprinkles a better word than Abel. First, uh, Hebrews 12, 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we, is, will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven? At which time his voice shook the earth, and now he has promised, yet once more I will shake the heavens and the earth. And this phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of all things that are shaken. Jesus is coming back again, not as a lamb. He's coming back as a judge. And by the breath of his mouth, he will destroy all wickedness, evil, and sin. All sin. The earth will be burned. And those that have not accepted his way, that have refused his way of salvation, will be destroyed and thrown into hell. Do not refuse him. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For they did not escape on Mount Sinai, and you will not escape when you die and, and stand before a God. You will not go to heaven. God, God is holy. And he says in 1 Peter, Be holy, for I am holy. God will not allow sin to come into his presence. Sinners will not stand before a holy God. That is why there's hell. And God hates hell more than us. He hates hell so much that he himself became the sacrifice, became the way out of hell. He says, don't refuse me. I, I'm so loving that I became sin for you. I took the curse of sin upon myself so that you can have eternal life. And then I start the process of making you holy. If, you're, if you claim Christ, but you want no part of God's holiness, I wonder if you really know Christ. I wonder if you're not following a, a false gospel and if you will be able to stand before the Lord and not be destroyed and sent to hell. That's between you and God. Think about it. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of all things that are shaken, and that is that he been made, in order that things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us offer to God acceptable worship, worship that he prescribes, and with reverence and awe for Hebrews 12, 29, our God is is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29 says that our God is a consuming fire. When he came to Mount Sinai, 
He said, make sure you're consecrated because I will break out against you if sin comes before me. That's who I am. I cannot dwell with sin. I am a consuming fire. If you try to approach me outside of, of the blood of Jesus, and if you think you can confess Jesus and not submit to the, the father of your soul and submit under the sanctification process, you are not a Christian. You have not submitted to the right Jesus. You're following a false teaching, a false doctrine. And you should fear that you will be consumed when you stand before a holy God. And that will be either at your point of death or when he comes again. Fear God. He's holy. God is a consuming fire. Do not refuse him who is speaking. He's speaking to you right now. He speaks in his word. He gave us this book that we are to love the Lord with our mind, soul, and strength. That is a commandment of God that hasn't went away. We are to love the Lord our God with all our strength, heart, soul, and mind. We're not to love another God that we've made up. We're not to love another God that a false preacher has told us. That's a false God. He might say the name of Jesus, but he does not hold to the teachings of the Bible. You're believing a false gospel. So, Lord, I pray that you would draw whoever needs to hear this word. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone listening to this who has refused your way of salvation, Lord God, and it has not come to Jesus Christ to be sanctified and cleansed, who has said that they will go another way, that today would be the day of salvation. Today, they would say, oh Lord, I'm not worthy to come in your presence and I don't wanna be consumed by your fire. I don't want your anger to burn against me. Thank you that you are a loving God and that you do not consume me right now. Lord, I confess that I'm under a false teaching. I wanna believe what the false teachers believe me that if I just follow you, all good will come. And when bad comes into my life, I don't understand it because I don't understand your discipline and your hand in my life. Lord, today, I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord. I want to know you as God for who you are, not a God that I want you to be. Today, I submit to you. I surrender my life. I want to know really who you are. Lord, I'm a sinner, I'm not holy, I'm not prepared to come before you. You are a consuming fire. I don't wanna be consumed in your wrath. Thank you for becoming the sacrifice to prepare me for heaven. Lord, today I surrender to the process of sanctification. I surrender my life to you. Make me acceptable in your sight, for that is why you saved me. I submit, I surrender to a God that I don't know fully, but a God revealed in his word. Help me, Lord. Sanctify me. Cleanse me with your blood, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today is the day of salvation. There is no need to go to hell. Not one person needs to be condemned to hell. God made a way out, and he hates hell. He hates hell more than you, more than me. He hates it so much that he hung on a cross. He was whipped and died and shed every piece of blood to save you from hell. That's how much he hates it. Be saved. Submit to God. Surrender, I pray. In Jesus' name.